Welcome to Virtual Fantasy Con. I am Kay In Lee, and today we have author Andy Peloquin. Is that how I pronounce your name? Yeah, well, technically it's Peloquin, but French Canadian <laughs> pronunciation is way too hard. So Peloquin is perfect. I love that. I love that. <laughs> and we also have Sarah Berman. Um, today we are discussing magic and superpowers. We'll be discussing what powers are overused. How do we create believable and compelling magic systems in our writing? And are there any powers that we'd like to see more of? I would like to uh, start with Andy. Please just give us a little bit about yourself and your writing and where you're from. I am, well, I'm kind of a, of a mutt. I was born in Japan, Canadian to American and French mother. So I'm all over the map. I write dark fantasy novels. Um, currently I'm working on a six book series about a half demon assassin. Pretty awesome, pretty dark, grim stuff. I like that. I love dark fantasy. I also write dark fantasy. Do you have any uh, titles that you can recommend that we start with? For, for dark fantasy, the king of, of grim dark, my personal favorite is Joe Abercrombie. And what about your collection? Uh, mine, uh, mine is called The Last View Solari. The first book is out. It actually just got nominated for a, a Roan Award, which I'll find out about in October, finger crossed. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I wish you great you. luck with that. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. And what about you, Sarah? Um, I am Sarah Berman, also Kali Sarah. Uh, I write urban fantasy. It skews to the psychological darkness. Um, I actually have the first of my full-length novels being published in September. It's called Too Weird, and it is the first of a series called the Runespell series, and all of that is searchable on Facebook. Um, and I've been published in a variety of anthologies. I actually have this one. Lovely. Was the most recent. And uh, so just a lot of, lot of work right now <laughs> getting yeah. all of that organized. <laughs> yeah. the, the series thing is interesting because you, you not only have the, the main plot of the book, but then the overarching plot, it gets a little complicated. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, I am Kay and Lee, and I am a writer of urban fantasy, epic fantasy, and paranormal romance. Um, my stories are also on the darker side. Uh, my my uh, first series is The Chronicles of Koa. It deals with angels and demons and different supernatural creatures. And um, I'm also the author of the Euro Chronicles, which is my epic fantasy sword and sorcery um, series. And uh, recently I've been a part of a variety of multi-author projects that um, all come from, uh, we, there's basically 30 authors writing in one world with all of our different characters, all of our different books, and it's a lot of fun. The Scarlet Legacy is the most recent, which is a paranormal romance. Wizards, shifters, mobsters with magic. It's pretty fun. That's <laughs> pretty awesome. Thank you very much, which brings us into our topic of magic. Um, in fantasy, magic is one of the key elements, and we'd like to dissect that today. Um, well, what about, you? what kind of magic do you guys use, Andy? Let's start with you. Um, well, my magic is, I, the world that I'm writing actually has very limited magic. The magic is created sort of by an ancient race that has been gone from the world for thousands of years. So there really is just a remnant of the power that they have. They've imbued everything into um, objects of power, but there's really no other magic left. The main character is a half demon, and so his magical abilities as it were comes from his from within it's all uh physical and everything there's you encounter magic throughout but you discover that it's not actually magic it's just um illusion or um abilities things that 
can actually be explained in modern society, except for, of course, the, ma the demon's ability to shift shape. That is sort of a, an inherent trait. But there is not much in the way of magic in the world. I like that. Um, you know, magic can have many forms, and I, I really like the uh, use of having it as part of their chemistry. It's part of their being. And yeah, yeah that's one of the ones that are most believable. Um, what about you, Sarah? What kind of magic do you use? <laughs> well, um, at, since I write urban fantasy, uh, my setting is essentially modern well, in, in the most recent case, Indianapolis. So it's, it's very hard to have like a really obvious magical situation. But yeah. you also have gods and demons coming into play. So it's all this combination of like what I call subtle magics. Um, if you're familiar with RPGs, uh, Werewolves the Veil, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of that. Uh, they they talk a lot about how people don't really accept certain things and how how magic has to kind of struggle against that. So um, most of what my character does is uh, aura reading, kind of uh, knowing how how to take the temperature of the room, so to speak, but also um, influencing with subtle emotions, like um, kind of a instead of thrusting people away in a crowd, it's more like people actively but unconsciously attempt to avoid her. So it, it kind of has that subtle skew to it. And, <laughs> and the only fireball was actually chemically induced, I promise. <laughs> that sounds exciting. Yeah, um, uh, for me, uh, pretty much a lot like uh, Andy, where I write about the angels, fallen angels and demons. And um, I like to have my magic be part of their, you know, physical, um, you know, their, their chemistry. And it, it's, it's very rare that I'll actually have someone, you know, conjure up something or a spell or, you know, something like that. I, I just got into that with my newest series, which just has witches. Um, but my witches are also born with their power. Um, they can evoke different spells as well, but I think that's uh, what I tend to, uh, tend to lean toward is having it be a part of who they are. Um, because like you mentioned, the RPGs, I uh, was heavily into MMORPGs, and, <laughs> and that inspired me a lot because you have your different races, and your races, you know, part of who they are is what they can do, their physical traits, and uh, I like to utilize that in my stories, um, where you have your different races, and they all have their different abilities, and if you put them together, they, you know, form this team and this bond that they can, you know, draw off each other's strengths. Um, so what do you guys think, what powers are overused in writing today? Let's start with you again, Andy. Huh. Well, I know, <laughs> yeah, I know witches, shifters, those are super romanticized genres, as it were, you know. I'm going to say a good 75% of the writers that I know or have contact with, they write something to do with witchcraft or shape-shifting or things like that because uh, it's just such a popular genre and it's so easy to do so many different things with. Whereas you find a lot of, of other subtler forms of magic like uh, the druidic style of magic or... Um, I actually haven't heard a lot about the Satanism side of things. Obviously, that's a very dark and extreme side, but that's a form of the, a magic system, as it were, that's not as used as, say, okay, I'm reading the ritual, I'm reading a spell, because witchcraft is so established in the world. Everyone knows that when you read the spell with the right ingredients, this is going to happen without actually understanding what it is about those specific words and that specific blend of ingredients that makes it come true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I, I do, it, it, the market is flooded with, you know, shifters and, and witches and vampires, of course, and now zombies, you know, yeah. uh, that's, that's our popular culture right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think are overused, um, Sarah? Well, um, 
I, I'm not sure that I would really say that any particular magic style is overused or any magical creatures overused because what I really love is seeing like the the vampires and the and the witches and the shifters with that little twist that the individual author puts on them. Yeah. You know, if if you got a if you have a unique twist, then you've got me in because I love it. <laughs> but um, I I don't like it when there's um, magic and gods and you know super powerful beings and they fix everything. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. don't like using magic and and the supernatural as like a deus ex machina. Yeah, that, that exactly drives me nuts. <laughs> yeah. um, in in my writing, I actually use the sort of cognitive dissonance between reality and using magic to create like this psychological issue within the people who, who use it. So like they have like this constant dilemma of, am I crazy? Is this crazy? What am I doing? I don't know how to do this. I have no idea what's going on. You know, just really delving into the, the psychological aspects of having to deal with it, particularly since I have my settings in contemporary earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, the, you know, those are the things that I like to see with magic where it's not just a fix everything situation. I, I totally agree with that. Um, what what I notice right now, I, I know that right now what is popular and what's catchy and what's going to be the next big thing is I keep hearing superheroes. You know, people are creating, you know, their own unique superheroes these days. And I think that is fantastic because <laughs> I love superheroes, you know. Um, of course. Marvel and DC and all of the the comics and everything so i think that's a pretty cool thing to look out to look forward to um now we will talk about how do we create believable and compelling magic systems in our writing i know we've touched on it a little bit already about how we you know make that part of their who they are and everything but um one of the one of the stories and series that I really love their magic system was Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series. Oh my gosh, it just blew me away. It was so unique and creative and totally put a new spin on things and I love that. Do you guys have any that you've seen that really just, you know, uh, that really spoke to you? Uh, we'll go with you, Sarah. <laughs> Switch um, well, uh, obviously I have a, a very contemporary fantasy uh, preference. I mean, I, I love me some high fantasy, but I, I, I'm really intrigued by the idea of, of these fantasy things in the modern world. And I'd have to say that the, the people who do that the best are, um, oh, and I'm going to forget his name, um, Hearn did the Iron Druid series. Kevin Hearn, I believe it is. I'm horrible with names. So. <laughs> And of course, uh, Jim Butcher with the Dresden Files yeah. does a spectacular job doing that where he's mixing all of these worlds. It's great. So th those would be the two. And um, I, I was really influenced by the Wheel of Time series, which Brandon Sanderson yes. finished that one up really well. <laughs> so, yeah, it's perfect. Yep. <laughs> what about you, Andy? Yeah, I'm going to have to say Brendan Sanderson again. <laughs> Actually, when uh, I started reading his work, but to finish The Wheel of Time, and then I thought, okay, he did such a great job. I'm going to go see what else he has. And I got into the Stormlight Archives, which is his latest, his latest series. And as I was reading his things, I, I ran into his Three Laws of Magic, mm -hmm. which he's actually, he's actually defined the three laws as one, an author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands that magic. The, the limitations always have to be greater than their power, and you always have to expand on what you have before adding something else. And those three laws are perfect. Like we've all been saying, you know, you can't use magic as a deus ex machina. So really having those limitations and understanding the magic system as you write it, even if the reader doesn't understand everything as long as you know the limitation and you have realistic limitations for me i've, I've followed those three laws 
very carefully when I create magic because I want to create a magical system that is as real as possible. Like a lot of the, the old school high fantasy, you know, the, you have this overpowered villain who doesn't actually use all of his powers until the final confrontation with the hero who's had years to develop his power when in reality he could have just gone and used his amazing power in his first confrontation with the hero and it would have been done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that was actually addressed really well in um, the Sort of Truth series. Oh, yes. Where, you know, it, it, I, I love it when, when authors really take that idea and they're like, well, magic is great, but it may actually be more trouble than it's worth. Yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the ones, for, one of the first fantasy series I got into. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> um, so, are there any powers that you guys would like to see more of? Let's do Andy. You know, I really like the, the subtler ones. You know, like, I, I read this, this comic book called The Worst X-Man Ever, where this guy, this kid's ability, his only ability is to be forgotten. No, no, no. His only ability is to explode once. And oh. he dies. <laughs> and he explodes. But they had the, the whole thing. He went through X-Men training. He lived with the other X-Men. He was, but, and then at the end of the story, his, his ability came in handy to save the world or whatever. You know, like, it was a very subtle, a very small power, but it worked. And there was another X-Men character who was forgotten. As soon as anyone looked away, he was forgotten. Yeah. And, yeah. and so stuff like that that's just so, you know, way out in left field. You know, there's the classic strength and flight and all of that. Those are... Those are common, they're fun to work with, but the ones that are just way out in the middle of nowhere, you know, the last thing you'd expect, those are the ones that I'd like to see more of. Just see how creative people can get. That is, a, that is really awesome. I really like the, the one that he's forgotten as soon as you look away. That's really cool. <laughs> That's just like the, uh, the silence in Doctor Who. Oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <They're> creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any that you like to see more of, or something um, you like to use in your your books? Well, I you know again I I use the the subtler ones. Um, the the things that uh, one of the ones that I was really happy with was um, she's she's essentially collecting the runes that. Uh, Odin created 18 spells, essentially, and this is all outlined in the Havamal, so this is all historically based. And um, essentially, the spells exist in the world as physical objects that humans can tap into by having these physical objects. And one of them is, um, it's protection is essentially what it is. If you go into battle, you'll be protected. And most people interpret that as, you know, you, you won't be hit or, you know, there's, it's some kind of shield or something. And when I, when I was writing it, you know, as you do, you're typing, you're like, what is going on? I have no idea what I'm writing. Yeah. <laughs> well, all of a sudden these runes are, they're not protecting people. They're essentially guiding their bodies in these self-defense moves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, doing like the rolls and the, the leaps and the, the ducks and everything like that, you just, you kind of relax and, and your body does this instinctively. And I was like, Ooh, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that too. That's so cool. And that, but, that's, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, but, you know, taking, taking something that so many people have an opinion on how it works and then changing that and making it different, you know, either more realistic or more, um, I, I like to use a lot of modern science concepts in, in my writing, you know, bringing in um, subatomic theories, you know, quantum, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, and, and bringing those kinds of aspects into the magic use because both of them are, are like this this little thing that we don't quite understand and they're both kind of miraculous and and they they really entangle very well mm, yeah but, you know having having a, a new perspective on how a magic works is great i agree with that yes um uh for me uh 
Uh, lately, my, in my newest series, it's the silent series. Um, this is my first time really uh, using witches, and I wanted to make my witches a little different because, like we've been saying, we like to see a new twist on these things. Um, so I, I I made them into these this sect of witches, they're grand elite casters. Uh, they can choose to be immortal if they want to, um, but it comes at a price. Uh, but also, I wanted to see their relationship with, against vampires. So I, you know, with my background in role-playing games, uh, one of the cooler powers that you could use in this game that I used to play is you could, um, you could basically use something to mute the powers of the per your opponent. So I gave the vampires the ability to do that to witches, where they can mute their powers or silence them. Um, and that was really fun to explore. Um, but yeah, I, I totally would love to see more twists on the popular genres, that popular um, creatures and stuff that we have right now. I'd really love to see uh, something done fresh and new with zombies <laughs> since they're being so used right now I would love to see something I don't know what it would be <laughs> but I'd love to see something fresh with zombies um, warm bodies was pretty pretty awesome that was a, a fresh take on this uh, this trope that we're seeing um, but yes uh, so what is next for Andy well, actually, I, I am going to continue to steer away from magic as much as possible just because <laughs> it's so much more fun. Like, um, for example, in the, the second book of the series that's coming out in August, you find out that these certain people have the ability to hunt demons down. And, of course, automatically your mind is okay because they're, you know, because they're pure of heart or whatever. They can hunt them down using some divine power. And then you find out that it's just an allergic reaction. It's just that simple. Something in their blood reacts to the presence of the demons in a negative way. It causes like a migraine headache, sort of like a, a severe gluten allergy, yeah. but to demons, you know. And really just finding more and more concrete ways to explain magic. Because someone um, in, in the last year or so, they really explained um, the the modern principle of, of witchcraft is it's just the manipulation of energy. So it took witchcraft from sort of a, a mystical thing to a much more scientific concept for me. You know, it's like, okay, so they're manipulating the electrons and the neutrons and the protons in their body to do, to have this desired reaction. So what else can the human body do? What else can, can we find a scientific explanation for magic? As well. So that's kind of where I'm going, getting as real as possible with all of these magical concepts. Oh, that's exciting. It makes me think of uh, uh, growing up, there was this movie called The Shadow. Did you guys ever see it? No. <laughs> it was Alec Baldwin, and he was a superhero. But basically... The <laughs> uh, courtiest movie ever. Yeah. <laughs> I loved it when I was a little girl. I'd watch it like every week. But <laughs> they talked about, you know, the part of our brain that we can't access and the part that we can't use and what, could we, what would happen if we could access that part of our brain. Uh, so that's what immediately came to my head when you wanted to have like a scientific explanation about these things. Uh, what about what about you, Sarah? What's next? Well, um, I will be focusing on my book release for the next couple of months and getting the second book written and polished up. And I'll probably do some uh, some more. I, I do enjoy the anthologies and the the short stories and stuff. You know, just to fill in the gaps on on time because you know you don't want to be bored right right <laughs> so uh, you know just uh get getting stuff written getting stuff polished getting stuff out there that that's pretty much going to be my focus for the rest of the year what's your uh, next release's title uh fluffy bunny fluffy bunny nice yes. <laughs> she's, she's actually going to join a cult and she's actually going to get brainwashed oh <laughs> Well, that's exciting. I'll definitely yeah. for that. <laughs> uh, is there anything else? Uh, what about you? What's your next title, Andy? It's called Lament of the Fallen. Oh, that's, I like that. That's a good ring to it. 
Uh, next, next for me, I'm releasing the third book in the Euro Chronicle. Well, second book in the Euro Chronicles, Night, Night of the Storm, uh, that comes out this month, as well as Spell Slinger. It's my sci-fi kind of steampunk, you know, uh, book that's uh, coming out, and I'm really excited because the third book in my Chronicles of Koa series is. Um, releasing at Authors After Dark um, alongside Sherilyn Kenyon. So wow. I cannot wait to meet her. <laughs> so um, that's next for me. And it was really lovely to meet you guys. I will be sure to put your social media and uh, links to your books on my website as well as my YouTube channel. And we will see you guys at Virtual Fantasy Con 2016. Hooray! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> you guys have a lovely day. You too.